But I'm going to tell you about a place called the Pole Green Church. Have you heard about this? It's near your home. Where you're up in Ashland or Mechanicsville? Oh, okay. I'm from Richmond. But uh, anyway, they're from this area. Have you visited this Pole Green Church? It's really an amazing place. It's just north of Richmond, Virginia. Uh, here's a picture of the monument to it. It was on the uh, battle lines between the Union and Confederate armies that fought all around Richmond during the Civil War. And uh, the artillery spotters were using the steeple to climb up into and used it for spotting for artillery. So the other army blew it away, destroyed the church, but they built this monument to it. This little church seated about 80 people, I think, was called the womb of the revolution. And we really need to understand how this happened. It was, really, it was because of one message preached there that it was in, I think, 1740 or right around that time, 30-some years before the Revolutionary War, one message planted the seed, lit the spark that resulted in the American Revolution. And uh, it was a message by George Whitfield. You've heard of George Whitfield, maybe one of the greatest preachers of all time. But he came there and preached a simple, straightforward message that they grasped. And there happened to be some people in the audience one of them was Patrick Henry uh, and a few of others that were of influence at the time. Patrick Henry was a very young man at the time. His house is only about uh, maybe 800 yards from this Pole Green Church, just straight up the street. And my sister's house is between his house and this church. You can see her house from that from this church, but uh, my sister and brother-in-law, but consider this. You know, we have God in us. You don't know what tiny little prayer meeting could set off something that turns the world upside down and releases people. I mean, we have got to start living according to the power of the one who lives within us. We're supposed to be supernatural beings. We're not, you know, natural beings supposed to have occasional spiritual experiences. We're called to be supernatural beings that have occasional natural experiences. That's our calling. We should be growing up into the supernatural. And... Uh, it's our calling, that's our destiny. Are we growing in it? Do we know the gifts of the Spirit that we have? Do we know the ministries that we're called to? And every single one of us have been given gifts of the Spirit, have been given ministries. And these are not toys. They're not to have fun and make our meetings more interesting. They're tools for building the kingdom and build in him a dwelling place. But we've got to grow in these. You know, biology teaches us anything that quits growing starts dying. Are we growing? Are we moving forward? Now, here's the man who was the pastor of this Paul Green Church. You may have heard of him, Samuel Davies. Some consider him the best you know, the greatest preacher in the Americas. Maybe the greatest preacher still that's come out of America. Now, some consider Jonathan Edwards the greatest intellect. And yet history has reduced him to one sermon, you know, uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God that he wrote, read in a monotone but it was so powerful, people start screaming, crying out, 
crying out for mercy, for help. They were under such conviction. And I'd like to see that again. I think we've had some taste of it. That's supposed to be what we're walking in. And, and we can't give up on settling for less. And guess what? We're just now, most of us, getting to the age where God can use us. Now, Moses was 80 when he got started. And we have a better covenant. We're supposed to be doing better than that. You should still be in the youth group. <laughs> really, faith, the father of faith, he was too old when God called him. You know, I appreciate all the people have a vision for the, all the multitudes of youth coming. I believe they're true. I believe it's going to happen. But you know what the Lord told me? And I inquired of him. I said, Lord, how do we prepare for this? He said, you don't. He said, if you try to reach the youth, you're going to lose them. Listen, if you haven't figured it out, after you're 30, you're no longer cool. <laughs> and you're not going to be cool. You're, and if you try to look cool, you're going to look stupid. And the youth don't need a bunch of old people and their parents trying to be hippies, trying to be youthful. They need fathers and mothers. They need you to be as mature as you should be. Do you get what I'm saying? Now, the Lord's going to reach the youth, but where does it say in Scripture, honor the youth? <coughs> I'm just saying... Lord told me if you try to reach them, you won't. You'll drive them away. You know, some people have a special anointing for youth and they just do attract them. That's great. And I'm really looking forward to when it happens. But you know one of the greatest parts of the revival that is coming is going to be for the elders that are coming? And you know when it says young men dream dreams, I mean see visions and old men dream dreams, I always thought that's because old men are just slept all the time. That's the only way God could get through to them. It's through a dream. But he said, no. He said, evidence of the Holy Spirit is when the elders, the elderly, start dreaming again like the youth. Start having a vision for ministry, a vision for purpose, vision for all these things. We need to be having more visions than the youth and we'll share some with them. But think of this one meeting. I think there were less than 80 people in that meeting. And it planted the seed that became the American Revolution. Now, if you ever visit, if you're driving up 95, just north of Richmond, before you get to D.C., of course, get off, you know, just punch it in your GPS, the Pole Green Church, and go visit it. It's awesome. Uh, but it's, it's got a lot of plaques and all about the great, the great things that happened there and happened in the Reformation till, till the Revolution and all. But the interesting thing to me is on the brick pathways that are like this, every now and then in the place that would be where that year would be, so many feet or whatever it is, is a year or a foot is a year or whatever. But when you get to like here's 1740, it talks about the great awakening comes to Virginia with the preaching of George Whitfield. It marks that spot with something happened, but it starts at the beginning of the Reformation and it sees that the American Revolution was a part of the Reformation of the church, the Reformation, where its place was in history. It wasn't just for our nation. Now, I wrote a book 
And I've talked about the dream I had when I saw was shown American history from heaven's perspective and how different it was. Guess what? All of our history is different from what we think it is. Nobody's getting history right. They can get some things right. There can definitely be merit to studying history and all. You can learn some things, but everybody writes from their own perspective. I've been reading history. I started when I was 15 years old. So 60 years now, I've been reading history and studying it. And sometimes you can read five different accounts of the same event, and they are five different accounts. And you know what? They may all be true. They all may all be right. They're just each one has a different perspective on what happened. We're seeing things differently. And we do all have our own filter that we kind of filter information through and see what we want to see. If you were asked your history, you would probably make it a little more interesting than it may have been. I'm just saying. Some of us would be more critical. We're more harsh on ourselves than anyone else. But we twist and we distort. But you know, God has accurate history preserved. They're called the books of life. Absolutely accurate and true. And he's going to open those books. And we're going to see history from his perspective. But I was just shown it in a dream one night, a brief time. I could tell from the vision I was seeing that where I was standing on the left-hand side of what was like a big video screen, a giant screen, <clears throat> that if I moved towards my right, we would increase in time towards the present. So I moved all the way to the end on the right to come to today, where we are. I wanted to see what's going on now, how heaven sees what's going on now. But heaven did not see that we won the Revolutionary War. They didn't think we'd won it. it. To them, that war was not about us getting free from the British, even though that was a good idea. I'm just saying. But uh, didn't think we, you know, we did it. We did get free. We got our freedom. That was important. But to them, the main thing was to be a place on the earth where there was truly liberty and justice for all, not just some, for all, and where all men would be treated equally under the law. All people would be equally, and there would be justice for all, and we didn't do that. <clears throat> so we had to fight a civil war. Because the job wasn't fully done in the Revolutionary War. And you know, the Revolutionary War was America's first civil war. You know, the patriots were fighting as many of the Tories and those who were loyal to the British as they were the British. This battle right over here near us in Kings Mountain had one British soldier on the entire field. It was Americans fighting Americans, mostly. It was a civil war. And the civil war was our second civil war, and it was a, also a revolutionary war where we're trying to get free. Didn't do, do the job then. We made progress. It's a terrible way to make progress. But we made progress, but not enough. We didn't really have bring liberty and justice for all. or We would have not needed a civil rights movement. And uh, But we're moving. We're still making progress. Still have a long ways to go. Racism is one of the greatest evils of the human heart. When the Lord said... When he was asked about the signs of the times that nation would rise against nation, that word translated nation, ethnos, literally means ethnic. 
He wasn't talking about countries fighting each other. He was talking about ethnic conflict. And what I saw coming in the next American revolution slash civil war, what I saw mostly was a race war. I went to see that movie, Civil War. What I saw in my dream was far worse than that. Far worse. That didn't even capture it. Now I'm praying that if we pray and we wake up and have a revival, have another great awakening, maybe it will at least be lessened. It can be lessened than what I saw. It was too terrible to imagine. It was every city in the country. Neighbors fighting neighbors. It was... Uh, it's just unbelievably terrible. And we're right on the verge of it. We are really getting very close to that kind of meltdown. <clears throat> so I'm just trying to encourage you tonight. <laughs> what can we do about it? I think we've got to have revival. I'm not looking for our salvation to come from the White House or from Washington at all. I think it can help. I believe in voting and whatever. But I tell you, I can't get too excited about that. Once you've seen the Lord, you can't be impressed by any person. And, uh, you know, the Oval Office is not that impressive. You see, the we need to see the throne room. We need to see the Lord. When he said, seek my face, do you think he was just tempt teasing us? Didn't you think, well, he really wants us to see him face to face? I started asking for it. I've had a number of encounters like that. And, uh, and I've I'm having more. I'm going to have more. But I had 15 days straight of seeing the Lord face to face right after the day after I got free of COVID. It's interesting to me. I was so weak. The health department called me and said, you're free now. You should be good. You can go out. So I, got, I was happy. I got out of bed, was going to go just go to the bathroom. It was about 10 feet away. I couldn't make it. I couldn't make it halfway there. I said, I'd never felt that weak in my life. I sit down and the Lord has to get me in a state of submission like that. And all of a sudden, boom, I'm face to face with the Lord. And that went on for 15 days, every day. When sometime every day, I would have a face to face meeting. And they weren't long I think the longest was maybe five minutes. But he told me something about the coming kingdom. <clears throat> the main thing he told me, I asked him a question. I said, you know, he was telling me how we have to prepare the way for his kingdom. I said, Lord, how? What's the main thing we need to do to prepare for your coming kingdom? You know what he said? Make disciples. Not just converts. We've dumbed down the Great Commission from making disciples to making converts. He said, make disciples. And then I said, Lord, how? How do we start? What do we, how do we do that? What? He said, start. You know, basic law of inertia, you cannot steer anyone that's not moving. We just need to get going. You may be going in the wrong direction, but if you're moving, he can steer you. He can show you. He can turn you around and get you going. Move. Do something. I know people say, well, I'm waiting for the Lord. I don't want to get my... And he's waiting for you. The Holy Spirit is the helper, not the doer. He's not going to do his part until we do our part. And if we're doing it wrong, he'll correct us. But if we're moving, if we're moving forward, he can steer us. But we've really got to get what it means to be a disciple and make disciples. There are very few Christians on the planet right now that are disciples. 
And as hungry as you guys are, and as much as you you would spend your money to come to a conference like this to be equipped and all that, that that, that helps. That's a part for sure. But I promise you, there are not many here that are disciples, not according to the Lord's definition of what that means. He gave us a clear definition in Scripture. When you read that all together, you're going to say, man, I may not have ever even met one. But you know that's okay. You know, in the Lord, when he walked the earth, there weren't many disciples. There were multitudes of followers of the Lord, and that was beneficial. That was great. That's a good thing to do, be a follower of the Lord. That's a start. But what he's after are disciples, and that's a whole new matter. You know, a disciple in the Lord's time, you know, to be a disciple of one of the great teachers in Israel, you could not even be married because you could have nothing in your life that would distract you from one focus, one purpose, learning from your master and becoming like your master. And that was it. You could have no other diversion in your life. Now, Jesus carried, he called those who were married because marriage is a big part of discipleship with him. Like I told you this morning, that's how he's going to kill you. That's how you're going to have to learn to take up your cross and die. Die daily. It's a good killing, but you're going to die. That's why he uses everything in our life for that. But do we use everything for that? Do we wake up every day? I've got to learn from my master today. I've got to become like him and do the works that he did. Is that the focus of our life? Or is it something we study about a little bit and talk about it once or twice a week? And that's not being a disciple. And read all the qualifications that Jesus himself said his disciples would be like. And would do. That's what we've got to become because we're not going to make others into disciples if we're not. And listen, I don't know anything better that we have to do. And it's getting late in the game. But if you've wasted 40 years with the Lord, a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. He can make up for that time that you've lost. He can do in you in one day what you would think would take a thousand years. But we have to get going. We have to respond. We can't go around this mountain again. Pole Green Church, just think, God is in us. What's it going to look like when he is manifested? And that's what his apostles were asking him after his resurrection, when he was, you know, or before his crucifixion, when he said, when will these things be? And what, what will be the signs of your presence when your presence comes, is manifested? There's a big difference in the manifested presence of the Lord and his presence. His presence is here now. If he manifested, we'd want to be crawling on the floor. I've been in meetings where that happened, where everybody hit the decks. And that's great, and that's spectacular. But that's just a foretaste. That should be normal church life. When his glory fills his temple, trust me, no flesh will be able to minister there. They're gonna, the flesh is going to have to flee. So, visit the Pole Green Church. Here's Patrick Henry's house. My sister's house, like I said, is between his house and that Pole Green Church. But one reason I'm showing you that, one reason I visited that, Lord said, we could be the womb of the coming revolution. We could be right here. 
He said we were called to it. Not everyone makes their calling an election sure, but that's our calling. Now, <clears throat> you know, a lot of us think, well, we've got to rally the people. We need grassroots movements and all. And that's great. That's wonderful. Revivals are wonderful and end gatherings are wonderful and awakenings are but what the Lord's looking for are just a few good people. He can take a handful of people and he gets more glory when he does it that way. The Pole Green Church was a very humble church. You know, Jesus was born in a stable. He's still being born in stables. Some of the most humble places you could imagine. And sometimes we get too, you know, big and too able for him to move. In 2014, when I was on that motorcycle, you're all still buying your tickets, I'm sure. But uh, one of the things he said to me was a radical change in my perspective. He said, you always thought that when I said, if just two or three are gathered, there I will be in their midst that if just two or three, he said, did you ever consider if there's more than that, I'm not going to be there? I said, no, I never thought of it. And he reminded me of these great unity conferences, Francis Frangipan and Mike Bickle and some of the other guys in us, we all did for a while. We would gather people from churches all over big cities and have big conferences and great conferences, great things would happen. Only thing was the Lord asked me, he said, how much unity did you leave behind? I thought about it and I said, probably none. He said, you tried to gather too many. We wouldn't even go to a city unless a high percentage, a good percentage of the churches would come together to sponsor them. He said, you went to too many. If you'd have just gone to one or two, those churches would have connected. They could have bonded. He said, and I wouldn't have been lost in all the activity. They would have seen me, follow me. They could have added more churches later, added more things. But he said, you're trying to build too big. He said, you need to start gathering two or three. And then he'll be in the midst. I'm just saying, I think that's one of the most important things. I know many of you are pastors and have churches and all that you're building. Start with two or three. You've, we have to have these small groups. That's where the equipping takes place. I mean, we got Ephesians 4 that we see that true ministry equips the saints to do the work of the ministry. Where's that happening? I know some places where some equipping is being done. But that's not the model of church life. Then he talks about how he's going to be there when there's a proper functioning of each individual part. Everyone has a part. Are we equipping the saints? But you know what? We cannot equip them. And when we're talking about making disciples, we're not making them our disciples. We tried that. There's a saying, that dog already bit me. And there was a discipleship that bit, every, bit a bunch of people. I know that. It was people trying to make disciples of themselves. Listen, that's a cheap... What did the Shulamite made say, Lord, where do you disciple your flock? For why should I veil myself in the flocks of your companions? There is a veiling that takes place when we just become the disciple of another person. Listen, we lead all kinds of people to Jesus, but all they ever get is us. We 
We can only lead them to him if we are with him. We are that close. We're his disciples. And then we're leading them to him. He wants to be their teacher. He wants to be their sheep shepherd. He wants to be our shepherd. Now, he'll use people. He uses people. He has teachers in the body of Christ. That's an equipping ministry. He has shepherds and, and all. He'll do it through people. But he also wants to be personal with every one of his people. But we need to look at every single gathering. God is in our midst. We don't want to leave until we've encountered him. We came to see Jesus, not just one another. That's good. The fellowship is great, but we've got to see Jesus. And that's our prayer for you when you come here to this place. Somehow, somewhere, could be in the elevator, it could be walking down the hall, could be in your room, could be driving to or from, but where you know you didn't just come here to hear some good messages or good worship or all that's great, but you came to meet with Jesus and you leave here knowing you met with him. Don't settle for anything less. And that's our prayer. There's a revolution coming. Let me share one thing with you that uh, he's going to do right here. Now, I honestly did not ever want to get Heritage USA. I did not have a vision for this place. Jim Baker, when he got out of jail, he started telling me, started telling our team, you're supposed to have this place and you're supposed to restore it. I'm going, no, I, I'm a missionary. I don't want to run a hotel. And uh, I really didn't. And then Reggie White, he, you know, he was on our board, a big part of our ministry for a while. And uh, Reggie would tell me all the time, how we're supposed to get heritage and restore it, make a ministry center out of it. He had all kinds of other plans, too. I said, Reggie, you know, I was on Reggie's board, so I said, Reggie, I'll, I'll help you do anything you want to do, but I think that's your calling, not mine. And then finally one day, you know, um, I don't know if you know the whole story, and I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but they sold all this property that had been Heritage USA. And it took like, it was a lot of closings. I can't remember exactly how many. It was like 15 or 16 that were supposed to take place the same time or the same day. One right after the other. We were the last one in line to get this property, the Grand Hotel and 52 acres and a bunch of and But all the others had to happen before we closed. And so I thought, you know, every closing, if you've done much in real estate, every closing is a miracle. <laughs> and I looked at this situation, I said, there's no way this is going to happen. But I told the guy who was selling the property, if it all happens, he, this, we were offered this property for $1.6 million if all these other closings took place. Now, Jim told me he had spent $65 to $75 million building it. And they were offering it to me for $1.6 million. I still didn't want it. <laughs> but I said, I'll know it's God if this happens. This is a miracle equal to the parting of the Red Sea and many of the others. For all these closings to happen, there's no way. Then it happened. Then they, last one came out and they called me in. They said, it's your turn. I go, oh no. <laughs> I felt like the puppy that had chased the train and caught it. Now what do I do? 
And I went in, I had a check for the 1.6. I didn't think I was going to have to use it. But uh, all of a sudden, it's mine. Then I come to look, look, I didn't know where we had gotten. I had all these TV crews, and, you know, this is a real famous place, but they were all following me around looking at it, and it was in terrible shape. It was unbelievably bad shape. And they were all saying, you really think you can restore this? I said, I really don't know. But it was a part of my job because the Lord had promoted me from being a disciple to being a bond servant, which means you don't have any time of your own. You don't own anything of your own. You'd, it's all his. And, and this was, he gave me jobs nobody else wanted to do. Gave me people to restore. Others didn't want to touch. It's part of my journey. But let me t read you a word we published in 1988 in our little prophetic newsletter. Did any of you ever get that? Yeah. Okay. Well, this you may, you may have seen this. In October of 1988, it was a prophetic word for heritage or PTL. And I, I'm just going to read it to you the way it was in there. It says, while praying with a group of men who were considering the purchase of this ministry, I saw the Lord walk up to a large stone, and as he touched it, the stone walk rolled away, and the grave was opened, which I knew that meant this thing's dead. It's going to need a resurrection. So knowing this spoke of resurrection and being surprised by it, I called Bob Jones in Kansas City to ask him if the Lord had shown him anything about PTL. He immediately said the Lord had shown him that it would be resurrected. Now, at this time, 1988, it wasn't dead. It was still thriving. Another group had control of it, but it was still thriving. This place was full and, you know, conferences going on here all the time. Now, it was to close later, but at this time, it was not dead. But I knew it's going to have to die first before God resurrects it because of this word. Bob said the Lord had shown him that it would be resurrected. He used that same word. He had been shown the widow's mites that had been put into this ministry. And the Lord said he had watched over them. And it was for them that he was doing this. So I then called James Robinson who was probably one of the big visible TV ministries at the time and awesome evangelist. I called James in Fort Worth and asked him if the Lord had shown him anything about PTL. And I remember James, I'd done some TV with him and stuff, and uh, I knew James kept mentioning PTL, how the Lord's going to restore it and all, but I paid him no attention. I just didn't want to. I literally told him, I think one time, that we need to just be like a good cat, cover up our mess, and go on. <laughs> you know, I had zero vision for this place. And uh, anyway, he said that the Lord had shown him and that he believed it would be resurrected, resurrected because of the widow might, widow's mites. Same thing Bob said. And then... Uh, Somehow I got this mixed up when I was changing it. But before there can be a resurrection, there must first be a death. And this ministry is not yet dead. The Lord is delaying his coming to its aid, just like he did Lazarus. And the doors will be closed and the grave sealed for time before he will move on this property. The stone will not be rolled away until he touches it. Now... <clears throat> I saw in that vision chains on the doors. I saw paper sealing the doors. Later, years later, when it closed down and stayed closed for seven years, I came over here, saw the chains, saw those papers just like I'd seen the vision. I knew it's going to be resurrected, but it took seven years before the resurrection. 
And you can't believe what kind of bad shape it was in after seven years of homeless people living in here. And uh, it, it was worse than you could imagine, trust me. But you know, we had our first meeting right here in this room seven years to the day from the last day it had been open when they had closed it. Seven years to the day. But at that time, it will be given to the stewards he has prepared for a fraction of the present asking price. The first asking price, I believe, was $65 million. And that's why these groups of businessmen were coming up here, and a lot of them would find me and ask me to pray for them to see if it was God's will for them to buy it. But uh, I had just moved to the area. Then he said, uh, it will be given to the stewards he's chosen for a fraction of the asking price, and the new ministry will not be under financial pressure and it will not be a financial burden to the body of Christ. Okay. Somehow I got this cut and pasted wrong, but a part of this word was that the new stewards, they are going to raise up a new breed of ministry here. And that's what I believe we're called to do. That's the revolution we are called to be a part of that's going to help the world make it through all that is coming and to reap the harvest. But a few nights later, the Lord spoke to me and said, when this ministry is resurrected, it will be a eunuch for the kingdom's sake. It will not never again rape his bride but it will be used to prepare her for the coming union with him in harmony, you know, with his purpose. Anyway, I'm sorry I chopped up this thing when I pasted this word, but I wrote all that in 1988, and now we're here. Now it is the time. What does it mean to be a eunuch for the kingdom's sake? Now, it's not talking about being a physical eunuch. But a eunuch cannot even desire the bride. You understand what I'm saying? It's not possible. And that's the way this new breed of ministry is going to be. They're not going to see the body of Christ as something, as an opportunity for them to build their ministry, for them to do their stuff. Their whole goal is going to be to prepare the bride for the king. There's going to be a ministry of that nature that comes forth from this place where we're sitting. Not about us. It's about him. That was October 1988. The bride's been abused there are not many ministries there are not many shepherds in the land what we think of is the church only about 10 percent of what we think of is the church is the true church it's a remnant right now anything any truth that gets institutionalized gets corrupted. That's why Jesus said he suffered outside the camp, it says in Hebrews, and he called us to go with, go to him outside the camp. We can't become a part of the camp. We cannot become institutionalized. That's when it gets politicized and everything else. It's going to start with making disciples. I think that's going to start with some. I hope all of you. But I know some here are going to go 
and you're going to search out what it means to be a disciple. And you're going to give yourself to it. And he's going to use you to make others. I tell you, what we see coming forth is going to come from a, he called them a little flock, that it was the Father's good pleasure to give them the kingdom. Little flock. It really is a little flock. I want to be a part of it. I think you do too. I don't think you would be here with a bunch of crazies like us if you weren't. <clears throat> but in my opinion, every one of the disciples were misfits. I think the ones who are become disciples today, they're going to be misfits in this way. They will not fit in to normal Christian church life like everybody else is trying to do it. It doesn't work. It's not working now. It's falling apart. The church is dying. All the statistics about Christianity is dying and all this, it's because all they're measuring is not the church. It's man's church, not God's church. Done man's way for men. But I tell you, it's time for something else to come forth. I think there are people here that are going to help make this happen. And it's going to come with a total devotion, total sold out. I've got to become like my master and do the works that he did. And Lord, I pray for every one of these hungry people that will come to something like this, seeking you, seeking to grow in you, seeking to hear anything from you. Lord, I ask you to personally meet with every one of these. Call them, draw them to who you've called them to be, not who the church, the institutional church would make them into, but who you've called them to be. You know, of the 11 sons of Jacob, I mean the 12 sons of Jacob, 11 of them were named by their mother. Only one was named by the father, Benjamin. And the mother, his mother tried to name him, Benoni, which means son of my sorrows, because she died when he was born. And trust me, there is a spiritual tribe of Benjamin coming. And when he's born, the mother is going to die. It's going to be a true parallel. But Benjamin, his, his father changed his name from Benoni, son of my sorrows, to Benjamin, the son of my right hand. What is the right hand? Power. Remember when Joseph invited his brothers in after they had gone back and gotten their brother Benjamin, brought him in. They still didn't know Joseph was their brother. He said they were seated before him according to their age, their birth. And the men looked at one another in astonishment, it says, because Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. He has saved his best wine for last. And guess what? He's called you to be here and be alive at this time. And I believe he saved his best wine for you. The last are going to be first. You're going to be the ones who see the works that he did and even greater works are going to be done. Benjamin's portion, Benjamin, the last son born, is representative of the last sons to be born in this age. What do you have better to do than to go for that? And we could talk a lot more about it, but we really need to understand the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What was Paul talking about in Philippians 3 when he said, I don't think I've yet attained? What do you mean? You've... He wasn't talking about his salvation. He attained that the day he believed in the atonement of Jesus. He wasn't talking about eternal life. But he said, 
I press on towards the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He saw calling so high that perhaps the greatest apostle, greatest missionary ever near the end of his life would not think that he had attained. Now, I don't think you can know you've attained to that in this life. You know why? Because two have attained to such a calling, to such a stature in the Lord, you will be so selfless. You won't be looking at yourself and what you've attained. You will be living so that he will receive the reward of his sacrifice. You will be looking for what he attains, not yourself. It's available. The calling is still open to be his sons and daughters, eternal heirs with him. Many, most Christians who are called Christians don't even see that calling. Or even offended sometimes if you'd mentioned something like, we're all going to be the same in heaven and read your Bible. Read the book of Revelation. Read those. But the door is still open. He's got you here for this. What do you have better to do? Amen.